Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to Shepherd of the Hills Lutheran Church. Today we are uh, celebrating the baptism of uh, Mariana uh, Reby. And so we'll begin with the order of service on page 12, the service of uh, baptism, and then we will uh, jump into the common service on page 15. And so uh, today our first hymn will be on the very back of your service bulletin, God's Own Child. I gladly say it. May the Lord richly bless our worship.
invite you to turn with me to page 12 in the very front part of our hymnal as we continue with the order of the sacrament of holy baptism. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Our Savior Jesus Christ commanded baptism when he said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All of us are born into this world with a deep need for baptism. From our parents we inherit a sinful nature. We are without true fear of God and true faith in God and are condemned to eternal death. But Jesus took away our sin by giving his life on the cross. At our baptism, he clothes us with the robe of his righteousness and gives us a new life. Our sinful nature need not control us any longer. We recall what baptism means for our daily lives as we speak these words. Baptism means that the sinful nature in us should be drowned by daily sorrow and repentance and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. to the command of our Lord and trusting in his promise he have brought this child to be baptized Jesus told us let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these it is in baptism that God grants the new life of forgiveness joy and peace to little children by the power of God's word this gracious water of life washes away sin delivers from death and the devil and gives eternal salvation to all who believe Mariana Reby received the sign of the cross both upon the head and upon the heart to mark you as a redeemed child of Christ. Mariana Rebecca Reby, I baptize you in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. The Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has forgiven all your sins. By your baptism, you are born again and made a dear child of your Father in heaven. May God strengthen you to live in your baptismal grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. The assembly may stand. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord commands that we teach his precious truths to all who are baptized. Christian love, therefore, urges all of us, especially parents and sponsors, to assist in whatever manner possible so that Mary Anna may remain a child of God until death. If you are willing to carry out this responsibility, then answer yes as God gives me strength. Yes, as God gives me strength. Let us pray. Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of baptism by which you offer and grant the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Help us to regard our baptism as the robe of righteousness we are to wear all the days of our life. Look with special favor on Mariana and grant her a rich measure of your spirit that she may grow in faith and godly living. Make us willing to carry out our responsibilities to those who have been baptized 
so that all of us may finally come to the blessed joys of heaven. Through Jesus our Lord. We'll remain standing and in the peace of the forgiveness that we have now celebrated in Mariana's life, as well as our lives, we sing a song of praise. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory be Join in the prayer of the day as it's found printed in your service bulletin. Lord God, you know that we are surrounded by many dangers and that we often stumble and fall. Strengthen us in body and mind and bring us safely through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated as we hear the word of God. Our Old Testament lesson is recorded for us today in 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning at verse 7. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it, eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day that the Lord gives rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry. 
in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Here ends our Old Testament lesson. We continue this morning with the Psalm of the Day. Psalm 78 is found on page 95. In the very front part of your hymnal, we'll sing the psalm responsibly by the half verse. We'll join together in the refrain and the glory be. second scripture lesson is recorded for us in Paul's letter to the church at Rome, reading from the 10th chapter, beginning at verse 18, reading through 11, verse 6. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people, whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed down their knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. 
Here ends our second scripture lesson. Alleluia. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to preach good news. Alleluia. 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 Let us stand now and join in confessing our common faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed as they are found on page 19 in the very front part of your hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from the Lord our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Gospel for Epiphany 4 will serve as our sermon text, Luke 4. It's a continuation of the reading from last week's Gospel. The reaction of Jesus coming home to Nazareth. Luke 4, beginning at verse 20. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. And he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. This is the gospel and the words of our text. Please be seated. In the name of God's Son, Jesus Christ, dear Christian friends, if you follow politics, you may have noticed that presidents of the United States tend to pick up popularity once they leave office and once they die. Maybe with the exception of Nixon or Jimmy Carter, but if you look at Ronald Reagan, especially Bill Clinton, you look at the first Bush, the latter Bush, the latter Bush is even picking up popularity now that he's out of office. The further away people get from politics, I guess, the more compassionate America gets with their politicians and the more they like them. But why is that? You know, they talk about the likability of Donald Trump and the likability of Hillary Clinton and it plays a big role as to who gets into office. And this much we can be assured of, whoever gets there is going to be liked a lot less when they're actually operating in office than when they leave. Have you considered the likability of Jesus? I would say, by and large, he's liked. 80% of this country align themselves with Jesus Christ. 80%. It's, that's a pretty high and favorable likability. But could it be for the same reason that people like presidents after they leave office? People forget the Bill Clinton who was a womanizer quickly. America's real forgiving after the person is gone and out of office. At the time, they're disgusted, but as time goes on, ah, okay, whatever, everyone's doing that nowadays anyway. So, you know, and the Bush, who apparently got us into a war that cost us billions of dollars, learned to forget about that too. And, and, and maybe after 2,000 years, folks are looking at Jesus and saying, you know what? I could get on the board with a person who tells us to feed the hungry, help the poor and the needy. I could get on board with someone who tells us to even pray for our enemies. He sounds like a unifier. Like Bernie Sanders. A unifier. What is the likability of Jesus Christ? Isn't it true when you cut through the chase, you find that everyone has their own personal Jesus made up in their mind. You dissect him in America and Jesus, by and large, is exactly what Israel was looking for, a unifier. There's an irony here. 
Jesus goes home to his hometown of Nazareth, and they were unimpressed. Isn't this Joseph's son? You are telling me, Jesus, you who I grew up with, you're the fulfillment of all of Isaiah's prophecies? You're telling me that you're the anointed one? You look every bit as ordinary as I do. We used to play kickball together. We used to play tag. Kick the can, all these wonderful things growing up, and you're telling me you are the one that all of prophecy is fulfilled in? You see, Israel was looking for a political Messiah to usher in something that they would gain personally. They wanted peace and prosperity. And the only way for peace and prosperity was to have a David Dick king, like the one a thousand years ago in Israel, who rooted out their enemies and ushered in an era of peace, unprecedented peace in Israel for a hundred years that continued through his son Solomon. It was about me, myself, and I. Not about a spiritual peace, but a political and physical peace and prosperity. And when you look at people and why they like Jesus today, it's for similar reasons. It's for similar reasons. They have pushed out the Jesus of the Bible and treated him like a smorgasbord, throwing out the things they don't like and keeping the things that they can get on board with in calling that Christianity. And we see it in the visible church across this country everywhere. They don't like what Jesus and God's Word has to say about marriage. You know, Jesus quoted back in Genesis, haven't you read? that the two, man and woman, shall become one flesh. They don't like to hear about that, Jesus, because that contradicts what our country's now view of marriage is. They don't like the exclusivity of Jesus that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to see the Father unless he come through me, unless he come through the cross. That, by and large, is exclusivity, is it not? We aren't exclusive in this country. We like them all. Lord, we want all routes to get to you eventually. And so people make up the Jesus that they want in their mind, but by and large, it's just like what we do with politicians. We like them when they're dead and gone. And so people keep Jesus at arm's length and sort of plug their ears to the actual Jesus of the Bible. So let me ask you, dear, dear friends, you keep this Jesus at arm's length? When opportunities come for you to grow with your brothers and sisters in Christ, do you keep that Jesus at arm's length? Are you one that would push him to the brow of the hill with the intent of throwing him off because you don't want to hear the Jesus that condemns your hypocrisy, your lies, your laziness, your greed, your jealousy, your anger? your condescension. Is that not the Jesus you want? So you keep them at arm's length and you just get the tips of the toes wet with the Christian faith. Because really Jesus sees it as no different than those who are desiring to push him off the cliff. You know, sin has created an incredible chasm between us and God. A chasm that was caused by our sin sin that we inherited first from our parents, sin that manifests itself often in our lives. And Jesus did not come to win political peace and prosperity for our lives. He came to win forgiveness and salvation. And anything less than that is not acceptable for a Jesus in any human being's life. Because the Jesus of the Bible came to seek and to save lost sinners. So God's people must not make excuses for sins. They must not rationalize or try to justify it in their life. They must not try to tweak the Jesus of the Bible and make him fit their own paradigm or human morals. They must accept what he does when he opens up our heart and reveals the shame and the disgust of the human soul. They must confess and acknowledge guilt and then put their trust in God who has taken his guilt, this guilt, our guilt, and died for it. Isn't that what John says in his first epistle? He says, 
If we say that we have no sin, we're merely deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. Take a look today in our text. I know it's not on your service bulletin, but you remember the reading. Look at how masterfully Jesus exposes the human heart to its greatest need. He's exposing the hypocrisy of Israel. Israel wanted Jesus to pull a rabbit out of his sleeve. And that's why Jesus quoted the ancient proverb, Physician, heal yourself. This proverb basically says, hey, you want to claim you're a physician? Show us a little authenticity to your doctorate and heal yourself. It's an ancient proverb. So Jesus was saying, I know what you guys are thinking. You're looking at me from Nazareth, not very impressed, from your hometown, and you want to see a miracle to back up my proclamation. Well, they're going to get their miracle. It's not the one that they're wanting, but they're going to first get the word of God. And so what does Jesus do? He takes them back to Old Testament history. He says, let's consider Elijah. Elijah considered a great prophet, one of the best. Remember, it's Elijah and Moses at, Mount, or at, um, at uh, the mountain that Jesus transfigured himself on. So Elijah is a pretty important guy. He never dies. He goes straight to heaven in a chariot and a whirlwind. So Jesus takes Israel, the Nazarenes, back to the story of Elijah. And he says, consider the famine, three years. Consider all the hungry mouths in Israel that Elijah could have fed, miraculously. Who did he feed? A widow from Zarephath, a Gentile. Not even one of you people. The message couldn't be clearer. God was rejecting his own because his own were rejecting him. His own were keeping him at arm's length, and so God says, all right, I'll go over here. In fact, that's why the famine came anyway. Jesus says, let's look at his successor, Elisha, great prophet as well. There were lots of people dying of leprosy in Israel. There were lots of people suffering sickness and illness. But who does God send Elisha to? He sends him to the commander of the Syrian army, your enemy, who's dying of leprosy. God's curing the enemy. He sends him to Naaman. Why would he do such a thing? Because you folks are keeping God at arm's length, and so he's turning his grace over to another people. Wow, did this ever. <laughs> you want to talk about putting a sword into someone, twisting and turning it before you pull it out. Jesus is getting under their skin because he's saying, not only are you rejecting God's Messiah, but God is working salvation for all people, even these measly Gentiles that you don't like. And so our text says, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, they drove him out of town, they took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. Guess what? They now get their miracle. The text goes on. Jesus walked right through the crowd and went on his way. They wanted to see a miracle, they got their miracle. Probably not the one that they were expecting, but they got their miracle nonetheless. But this raises another question for us today. If Jesus walks away from this hill in a miraculous fashion, why doesn't he walk out of Pontius Pilate's courtroom before he enters onto that hill called Golgotha? If you want to compare deaths, which would you rather have? the 16-hour long, torturous death by crucifixion? Or to have people throw you off a cliff, break your neck probably on the first fall, and be dead in seconds? I, it, obviously, we'd choose the cliff if we had to. Why does Jesus not walk out of Pontius Pilate's courtroom? Pilate wanted to hear what the truth was. Why didn't he walk out of the kangaroo court of Caiaphas and Annas? Why didn't he take that, that, that wicked Herod and, and, and walk right out and say, these chains that you guys have me on, they mean nothing. I'm the son of God. I'm the one who sets the sun, moon, and stars in this planet. You can do nothing to me. The answer, of course, is he could have. 
The argument is, from our perspective, he should have. But he didn't. Why not? Why not? The Son of God was working in conjunction with the Father's will. And the Father knows how great our sin is. He knows the hypocrisy of the human heart. He knows you and me better than we know ourselves. He knows our desire to keep God at arm's length in our lives. That creates a great chasm between us and God. God doesn't want a chasm. He doesn't want to curse you eternally. He doesn't want to damn you, consign you to hell. And that's why he sent Jesus. But Jesus was not consigned to a pleasant death off of a cliff. It teaches us something about the hill of Golgotha by which he would be tortured and crucified on. Consider why the Gospels record for us in such gruesome detail how the Son of God died. That he would be punched in the face and he would be spat upon. He would have a crown of thorns shoved into his skull and the staff that they mocked him as a king with, they would beat him on the head again and again and again. What are the Gospels trying to teach us about the Son of God? That sin puts damnation on all of us. But God, our Father, does not want to damn the very people he created for himself. And so he puts it all on the Christ. That's why it's all recorded for us in such gruesome detail. That's why Christian churches put Jesus on the cross. So that kids look up and say, wow, what an ugly way to die. The Old Testament says, cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree. Damnation was given to anyone who was hung on a tree. And because the cross is hewn from a tree, Jesus Christ was damned by Almighty God. So that I wouldn't have to be. So that you wouldn't have to be. And so this now, which was a symbol of damnation, is now the greatest symbol of love. Something that we treasure in our hearts because through it we have forgiveness of sins and we have an escape from an imminent death that awaits you and me. We have life with God. We have fellowship with God through the cross. Don't let Jesus become another politician like he is for so many in this country and in this world. Don't let him increase popularity because of some dumb prosperity that he's supposed to bring to you. No, glory for the Christian, dear friends, is hidden in weakness and suffering and in pain, in discipline and sacrifice. That's where glory is. Prosperity comes in heaven. You got time to kick back and put your legs on the easy chair when you die and go to heaven. Now we got work to do. And what's our work? To tell others that Christ has removed the curse of sin from them. To tell our children to tell our friends, to tell our family, to spread the holy gospel at what cost? At the same cost we see it costed Jesus when he went to his hometown. Yeah, people are going to mock you, make fun of you, reject you. But you know what? Somebody conveyed the gospel to you and me. Somebody brought us to the waters of holy baptism and communicated Christ to us. And now we shall do the same. Because that's why we like Jesus. That's why we love Jesus. He's the Savior of all humanity. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may it guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus. Amen.
Eat it as we gather our gifts for the service of our Savior. Please stand. Following the prayer of the church, we'll join in the prayer our Savior taught us. Today in the prayer of the church, we keep in our prayers the Bubaltz family. Uh, Steve's mother is now entered into hospice into her final, uh, uh, final chapter of this earthly life, so we keep them in our prayers. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, who came to seek and to save that which was lost, it is truly a blessed and faithful saying that you, God's own Son, came here to suffer, bleed, and die to redeem us sinners. And you have even supplied us the gift of faith through the Holy Spirit that we might personally make your salvation our own. <clears throat> Thank you, blessed Jesus. Oh, may we never again be wandering sheep, helplessly lost by sin and unbelief from the heavenly fold. Send your Holy Spirit to guide and protect us by your word. Keep our feet from straying into sin, our hearts from yielding to doubt and unbelief, and our minds from falling prey to false doctrine. Give us continual victory over everything that would rob us of our trust in you. Keep our lives uncluttered by the attractions and cares of this world. O oh, Savior, fill our hearts with such firm reliance in you that we will be prepared at all times should death overtake us. May we successfully endure any trials that may test us in life and death, in prosperity and adversity, in good times and bad times, draw our hearts close to you. Whether it be pain or pleasure, cross or comfort, safety or danger, in youth or old age, health or sickness, whatever our condition or station in life, help us to glorify you by true faith and patient, godly living. Cause all who have been careless and slothful in spiritual matters to repent of their backsliding and to strive with the Holy Spirit's aid to be fruitful in good works. Lord, help us lest we be weighted down with earthly matters. 
and give us the desire to apply our hearts to heavenly wisdom. May it be of daily concern to us to live our lives ever more free of sin, doing what pleases you. Have mercy upon our human weaknesses and forgive us our many sins. Finally, make us partakers of your glory in heaven. Lord, countless sheep are still lost and straining, running swiftly but surely to their eternal destruction. Have mercy upon them and restore them through your means of grace. Give us a love for souls and make us bold to go out with the gospel to seek and save the lost. May the blessings of salvation and of your gracious presence rest upon us and our homes and upon all who are dear to us. To the glory of your name we ask this. Amen. Merciful Father in heaven, we also come before your throne of grace because you invite us to cast all our anxieties and cares upon you. We pray, dear Lord, and send our prayers to your throne on behalf of Steve and his wife Jan and their and their family as they uh, mourn the suffering of their loved one. Dear Lord, help them be comforted by your holy gospel, that it was by your grace that you brought their mother Violet through the waters of holy baptism, wrote your name on her heart, made her yours for this life and all eternity. We thank you for the many joys that they've had with her. And now, dear Lord, if it would be your will, we would ask that you would ease her of her suffering in her last days here on earth and that you would bring resurrection joy to all the family members of a gracious reunion with you in the kingdom of heaven. This we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated.
for closing prayers. Almighty God, grant to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above. Let nothing hinder your word from being freely proclaimed to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, so that we may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your name as long as we live. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. 